ladies and gentlemen, I'm Joe Crowley. Welcome to the Quilter Cheviot Theatre for our final session of Country Fire Live. Thank you for joining us. Now, our next speaker here had an extraordinary idea a few years ago, uh, which had the potential to well, it does have potential to revolutionise the way we grow and source our food. I think we've got pretty good at food labelling in this country, and it's sometimes quite nice to know that the potatoes you just bought are from Farmer Jones in Norfolk or Lincolnshire or wherever. But when you glance at a packet of salad and you see it's grown by Rich in Clapham, then you think, what's going on? You sort of wonder if you should get in touch with your optician to bring your next appointment forward. But actually, that's what's happening. And you can now buy fresh salad greens with no fertilizer, certainly no air miles, grown in perhaps one of the most populated and developed places, certainly in the UK, maybe in the world, in London. And how? It's been done by growing underground, and I think it's 100 feet under London, to be precise. So here to tell you more about this concept and the marvellous business he set up, please welcome Richard Ballard. Thanks very much, Jay. Thanks very much, uh, everybody. Thanks for coming. And um, my name is Richard. I'm one of the co-founders of Growing Underground. Growing Underground is an urban farm situated 33 metres under the streets of Clapham in a World War II air raid shelter. We use hydroponics and LEDs to produce microgreens, which are tiny herbs packed full of flavour. We pack these, we ship them into New Covent Garden Market, which is less than a mile down the road, and from there they're distributed over the capital to various hotels and retailers. Um, we power the site entirely by renewable energy, and we're working towards a low carbon um, uh, accreditation. Um, so today I'd like to talk a bit about the location and the history um, and also the social and environmental benefits of growing in this environment. Then I want to touch on the idea and the journey getting to this uh, stage. And then I'm going to finish off with a little bit of, uh, about the future of food technology as, as I see it uh, and our plans for expansion. So um, I've got a, if you can see the screen, um, there is a plan of the site. So it's a deep level shelter. It's um, two tunnels that are half a kilometre in length. Um, it's 6,000 square metres of space, which is about 65,000 square feet. Um, and the two lines above are the, it's actually the northern line. So the northern line goes above us, about four storeys. Um, in, the, in the corner, there's a cross section of the tunnel, and there's a mezzanine floor that goes through the centre. And in the war, they would have had bunk beds on the top side of the, the, the tunnel and on the lower side. Um, now we use the top level for growing the, for the farm, for actually growing the, 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 the crops. And on the lower level, we use for water tanks, um, uh, utility water pumps, and that sort of thing. So um, there's, a, there's also a video that you may be able to see from the screen, which shows the tunnel as a 3D model. Um, so they were built between 1940 and 1942. And they were a family of seven, stretching from Belsize Park in the north of London all the way through to uh, Clapham South. Um, they had the, uh, the, sorry, they were each designed to house about 8,000 people, so um, they, were, they were very large. Um, they had the foresight to think about the use of these after the war, and they built them in that linear fashion because the plan was to link them up and have an express northern line after the war, but they didn't have the money, so that actually never happened. Um, TfL inherited them in the 1990s, and they used, they were, some of them weren't actually used at all. Um, some of them were used uh, for storage. In fact, the one at Gooch Street is, um, apparently houses the original Beatles four-track recordings in a hermetically sealed it, box. Um, so, and apparently there is also a link from that one to the, the postal uh, track that goes across London as well. Um, so they had this, this um, idea of linking them up. So I'm going to start to um, talk a little bit about the social and environmental benefits. So we think it's really important to, um, to integrate sustainability with business and working towards a low carbon economy. Um, any business today really needs to think about its impact on the environment. And this was one of the key drivers for us when we set up Growing Underground. We use um, a, a recycled water sy system, a hydroponic system, which is very water efficient. It uses 70% less water than conventional agriculture methods. And um, it's an enclosed loop system. So all the nutrients that you use stay within that system. They don't um, seep out into local habitats. Um, we 
use all the waste that we use, which is predominantly our substrate, which is um, a recycled carpet that we grow on. Um, once we harvest the, the product, um, we're left with this root structure in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in this carpet. So there's nothing really we can do with that. So we send that into to South East London, and it's incinerated. And from that, electricity is produced. And we use that to offset our carbon footprint. Um, we are working towards a carbon neutral certification. Um, we tally up all of the costs, um, all the carbon embedded in any, any services we use or any products we buy for um, the tunnel, and we tally this up and we, we offset that um, at the end of the year. We're working with Natural Capital Partners, uh, which is a former carbon neutral company, and the Woodland Trust to look at um, um, ways of offsetting that um, through deforestation, uh, reforestation um, um, uh, initiatives. So the whole site is actually powered by renewable energy. Uh, we use good energy, which use off-site wind and solar um, across the grid. And anything that their customers take out at one end, they make sure they've got the infrastructure in place to provide that renewable power from the other end. Um, it's very important for us to reduce our impact on climate change. But irregardless of climate change, the um, slipstream benefits of a low-carbon economy are attractive in their own right. It's much cleaner, it's much quieter, and it's much more efficient. But the main reason we set up Growing Underground was to produce hyper-local food, producing food from the city, for the city, from within the city. Um, and this um, helps reduce the distribution models, food miles, and it also reduces food waste by producing food that doesn't have to travel uh, vast distances, we can get that into our customers much quicker, offering a longer shelf life and to the end consumer. Um, it's actually a very efficient way of growing in, in a tunnel. We are underground, it's 13 to 15 degrees year round. Um, our micros require about 20 to 25 degrees, um, and with um, our LEDs actually produce heat as well as light. So that takes that temperature up for us. So with ventilation at both ends of the tunnel, uh, and small fans within the growing areas, we can optimize the perfect environment for growing and have that environment year round. Uh, and um, another benefit as well, we don't actually use any pesticides on, on the crops. So a lot of people ask about the idea, where the idea came from. Um, I previously ran my own business. Um, uh, I started this in my early 20s. Um, it was a garden furniture business. and. Um, uh, it was reasonably successful. Um, I got to about 2008 and it ran into difficulties. I was forced to put it into to liquidation. Um, it sort of gave me a time to sort of rethink my life path and um, I had time on my hands, so I started to study and research. And before I knew it, I was applying for universities in London to embark on a film degree, which is something I always wanted to do when I was younger. So I moved to the capital um, and um, I had a lot of time on my hands there with being a student. and. Um, uh, much to the amusement of my friends who thought I was a, um, having a bit of a midlife crisis, which I probably was. Um, so when I arrived, I, there was a lot of interest in what was going on in London. Crossrail was being built. There was a lot of uh, infrastructure underground, which I was fascinated with. So I started to look at this for a potential idea for a film. Um, as well as this, I was very interested in sustainability, the future of cities, science and tech as, as a whole. Um, and this led me to the futurist Jeremy Rifkin. Um, whose ideas about the third industrial revolution really resonated with me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Jeremy Rifkin later. He's a very interesting character, and I highly recommend any of his books. Um, so for this film, I pose the question, how are cities of the future going to feed and power themselves with a growing population? I did some um, research um, into LED technologies. I saw that it was now possible to grow without the aid of natural uh, sunlight. Did some calculations, and I spoke to my friend Steve, and, and Growing Underground was born. So this is a, um, a picture you can see on the board from the early days. So initially, we approached TFL, who are Transport for London, who own the, the space. And um, we approached them back in 2012. Um, prior to that, we were actually looking at a tunnel um, underneath Holborn in the city of London, which was the ex-MI6 communications hub between the former Soviet Union and the USA during the Cold War. But this uh, was top secret until the 90s, and it proved very difficult to gain access to. So um, we eventually gave up with that site and, and, and found the site that, that um, TFL were uh, had in Clapham. So um, they were quite intrigued with our idea because prior to that, the only interest they had had in the space was people that wanted to set up a, a nightclub. And they knew this was never gonna, they were never going to get planning permission, so it, it, they didn't entertain it. So when we turned up and said that we were, wanted to set up a farm and we'd have limited um, people in the tunnel, which was their main concern, 
um, they, they were interested. So from these, this early um, stage, we, um, Chris, who's one of our directors, he's been in hydroponics for about the last 35 years. Um, he said, yeah, you just got to get into the tunnel. You've got to grow something and see if it works. So um, we, we, we started to grow some lettuce and some herbs. There's a picture there of my, um, my business partner tending to the first crop. Now, um, I'm actually from a family of growers. Um, my mum and my dad both grow vegetables. And the first thing I actually ever grew was, was in a tunnel. So um, I've really now got the bug for it. Um, so the, the early stage, um, when we set this little um, system up, I'm just going to show a, a short film of the tunnel in the early days. So um, we needed to, once we set up this, this first system, we realized we actually needed to check on the plants. Um, not growing anything before, this sort of basically hadn't sort of hit me before. So we realized we had to go down and check on the pH, check on the nutrient, check on the well-being of the plants. So um, and pr prior to this, me and my business partner would meet up and, and go down together. As you can see, it's very dark in the tunnel. Uh, if, I don't know if you can see the screen, but it's very dark. 200 steps, very little, um, no, no lift. If you have an accident down there, there's no um, um, way of ringing out or getting anyone to come and get you. So we had this system where, before we went into the tunnel, we would um, ring each other and say, look, I'm going into the tunnel, a bit of a drill. Uh, if I'm not out in an hour, you know, send out a search party. Um, so, um, so we took it in turns, and after a while, we got, we got used to this. And, uh, um, then we used to wind each other up a little bit, but every time we went down into the tunnel, we'd say, you know, that little dark bit in the corner, I'm sure there's somebody living down there. And these sort of things did play on our mind a little bit because it's such a vast space down there and very dark, um, and, and your eyes uh, play tricks on you. You think you see something move at the end of the tunnel. You've got a ventilation sounds or tubes going above you. It's quite eerie, I've got to be honest. On your, first, uh, on your own, when you go in on your own, first time, it was uh, pretty scary. So anyway... Um, we, we set about this drill, and then on one day when it was my trip to my turn to go into the tunnel, um, my, um, I went down and the, the padlock had been tampered with. Uh, stupidly, I went down into the tunnel. Um, when I got down there, things weren't quite in the same position as they were when I was originally there. Um, and um, I noticed as I went into the area where we're growing, if you look up on the, on the boards, you'll see this. Um, there, there was a message for me written on the board, if I can get it to work. Do not go beyond here. This is my home. Fearing serial killers, I got the hell out of there. I ran up the stairs very, very fast. Called my business partner. He said, call the police. So I rang the police. They were obviously very intrigued to know what we were doing down there, what we were growing especially. Um, so they came down, had a look around, and saw what was, what was actually happening. Nothing was stolen, so we put this down to urban explorers with a, a dark sense of humor. I mean, they could have just signed their name. Um, this really did play on our, um, our fears a little bit, actually, after that security was ramped up and uh, we got a, an intern in to help us uh, to, with the work, a, a quite a big intern guy from, um, to, to help me out with, with, with some of the work. So, <clears throat> so we arrived at this stage where... Um, we had tested all the, the, this first round of, um, of crops. We sent them off for tests, check if there was anything dangerous in the environment, any heavy metals or um, anything, and everything came back and it was fine. So we went on to stage two, which is, um, if you can see the picture here, was um, the next setup where we tried to attract some investment to take this business forward. Uh, and also we in invested in a bit more kit to to try some yield tests and density tests for crops. So microgreens are, are grown in a different way to uh, conventional herbs, so you, they're quite tightly packed. So you've got to do a lot of um, density trials, yield uh, trials to see what yields you get um, to get the perfect crop. Um, so we thought about setting up a social enterprise, but we eventually decided on a private company so that we could scale, um, sorry, so that we could uh, sell equity and scale much quicker. And we opted for crowdfunding rather than the conventional route of, of banks and angel investors who weren't really interested. Um, angel investors, this was a little bit early for them um, when we started doing this, so they weren't really too sure of what we were doing. Two young guys with a, um, a small tunnel under, under London, it wasn't really appealing to them. The banks weren't lending, they still aren't really. Um, but the ethos of crowdfunding really appealed to us, um, and this allowed the public to reap the benefits of investing with us. We feel that we're moving towards a more collaborative sharing economy, which is aided and powered by using the internet. 
And this was proven in our crowdfunding campaign where we reached a worldwide audience through TV and online media. And we ended up raising £650,000 in our first round on just the idea. And this attracted investors from all over the world, which were very helpful to the business as we've progressed through. Technology and the open source exchange of information are breaking the restrictive borders of our world for the better. Uh, one person can make a real change. Any of you here today has all more information available at your fingertips with the aid of a smartphone than the American president had 30 years ago. In the last 25 years, we've seen the internet change in the way we interact with each other and the way we do business. This will dramatically transform further with the advent of the Internet of Things. Just to clarify, um, the Internet of Things is a, um, a network of physical and electronic devices embedded in objects, buildings, and transport, uh, which enables these objects to collate and exchange information over the Internet, quite like um, a, a fridge that reorders your produce from Amazon, say. This combined with clean, distributed, renewable energy will change lives. Jeremy Rifkin, who I was talking about earlier, actually links the connection between new energy regimes and communication technologies to the advancement of humankind and consciousness throughout history. He says the first industrial revolution, where we saw the energy regime of steam power and the communications technology of the printed press, leading to the advancement of the education and centralized employment. Now, we saw um, huge um, steam power press uh, printing um, books and, and literature, and, and the romantic novel was invented around this time, and that changed consciousness, which it developed empathy. It took humankind a, a, a another step further, a uh, step onwards. And also, with all that literature, we, we set up a schooling system that then fed into that industrial age and trained people how to, to, to work within that um, centralized employment. And it, it took humanity on that step. The, the second industrial revolution, as he, he calls it, where we see oil as the energy and TV, radio, and the telephone as a communication system agile enough to handle this new uh, power. And we saw unprecedented movement of um, people and ideas in the 20th century. Now we're moving into um, the third industrial revolution, as he calls it, which, is, um, which moves away from that centralized energy system. Renewable energy combined with the internet allows us to um, enter a new sharing economy. It sees humankind entering a phase which is distributive and collaborative by nature. Um, for example, um, any one of you here can produce your own energy on your roof with solar PV or a small wind turbine. With the eventual integration of the smart grid uh, network and electronic storage, you'll be able to store that information sell it, uh, um, or store it, or use it later, sell it back to the grid, or share that to local communities and even around the country. This method could potentially see humankind producing an abundance of renewable energy. And this would negate the need for the current expensive, centralized, non-renewable, finite fossil fuels. Um, Jeremy Rifkin's plans have actually been adopted by the EU. He's a, um, um, an advisor to Angela Merkel and lots of heads of state in the EU. Um, he's also um, the, Chinese pre the new Chinese premier has taken on board these ideas. And China has actually since invested 82 billion pounds in the sorry 82 billion dollars in a commitment to the third industrial revolution. <clears throat> this advancement in technology, along with the Internet of, uh, of Things, will become increasingly vital in my industry, allowing us to become much more energy and resource efficient. Um, it'll allow us to store more accurate data, um, and we'll be able to measure every last drop of water and energy being used within the farm. The Internet has launched many great ideas, but the Internet of Things will, will revolutionize our lives. We are working with computer systems for controlling horticultural environments. We're working towards controlling humidity, temperature, light, air flows, and CO2 within the tunnel, and communicating this and sharing this over the cloud. IBM did a recent study uh, and a report, and currently we are using 14 billion sensors in operation in the world. By 2020, this would have increased to 30 billion. But by 2030, this would have increased to 100 trillion. This is this exponential growth in technology that we're seeing, which is really going to revolutionize the next um, uh, century. So um, as well as this technology, our LED suppliers have started to develop LED units that can recreate any light spectrum. They're starting to create light recipes for specific plants. 
Um, rep this enables us to, with sensors in different parts of the world, we can replicate environments in, say, Kenya or Indonesia and transfer that information over the cloud um, to, um, to, say, a lab in London. And this would enable us to look at new crops, new hybrids of crops. Um, and um, the, um, the potential for this could be used by climatologists to trial new crops under conditions not yet, yet experienced. Um, and with climate change effects on the planet, this may be needed. Um, the future use of this technology could see us growing Peruvian coffee beans in a warehouse in the UK somewhere, or replicating the perfect vintage year for wine every year. The real game changer, as I see it, is when we have an abundance of cheap, renewable energy, we can produce the staples like wheat, soy, and maize. Um, and you imagine this in the future where you have these vertical farms on the outskirts of cities like, say, for example, in Brazil. They're producing all the staples for that city. There is no need then to destroy the, the local habitat in the, at the Amazon basin and the Amazon rainforest and allowing that to go back to its natural state. So um, I'm just going to finish off with um, a little bit of a talk about um, our expansion plans. Um, just on the board there, you can see, or on the, the, the screen, you can see um, um, some of our produce. So we, 2015, we finished building the farm. 2016, we started to supply into the New Covent Garden market, and that was predominantly to the food service, to hotels and restaurants. Then earlier this year, we, we um, um, put out a, a retail brand that is now being sold in the Cado nationwide and in Farm Drop and Planet Organic in, in the capital. And we're in the process um, in the next uh, few weeks uh, to announce we're about to go into one of the leading um, high-end retailers in the UK. Um, so that will be, uh, will be announced very, very soon. Um, so basically, these, um, these punnets are a mixture of um, pea shoots, which is the base, with two microgreens that complement that area. So we've got a, an English salad, a Chinese, uh, sorry, an English salad, a Japanese, an Asian, an Italian. Um, and basically, the English has mustard and broccoli with, with a pea shoot. And then the Japanese has wasabi mustard with pink stem radish. Um, and it's got a real fiery taste. So the plan is, is to expand this range, expand um, into the rest of the tunnel. We're only using 20% of the space at the moment. Um, and um, uh, then the plan is, is once we've uh, expanded into the rest of the tunnel, look at other sites around the world around the country and then potentially around the world. Uh, when we launched this business back on um, 2014 on our crowdfunding, um, uh, sort of the PR that we had around it, we had a lot of interest in, from all over the world and a lot of investment from, from different people around the world. Um, but we also were offered lots of spaces from salt mines to nuclear bunkers. So the future, maybe we'll see uh, growing underground, expanding into Tokyo, Berlin, London, New York and Los Angeles. That's the, that's the dream, and, uh, and um, I'm free to answer any questions you might have, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I think you'll agree that is uh, transformative, isn't it? Absolutely fascinating. And just a word on price. You know, I know uh, you said there's an announcement coming up. Presumably that's a big supermarket, but uh, are we paying a premium for, for these sorts of greens grown in this way? No, um, we are... Um, our retail, our retail, sorry, our food service packs are um, competing with the other companies that are doing this in conventional greenhouses. Um, our retail packs, um, they uh, are competitive, but because we're the first people to actually mix microgreens with um, a, a bag salad, so um, so they are higher priced because we use a lot more seeds. So it still is competitive. Yeah. Um, but it's a slightly more. But it's not because you're growing it underground. It's because of the no. product you're you know you're mixing exactly. it and, and the quality. Exactly, yeah. Um, so that's very exciting, isn't it? Because then it, it shows it really can be done. So economically, this isn't just a one-off that people crowdfund, but something that actually can be proved and can happen elsewhere, like you're saying, in Los Angeles yep. or Tokyo, wherever. Exactly, yeah. And why greens? Why salad greens? And why not something else? Is this, <laughs> is this the sort of the litmus test? So um, currently, um, this works with crops that grow within uh, a certain time range because of the LED, the cost of the LED to use it. Um, so we're finding crops that are grown under sort of 28 days are, are, are economically viable, and that's pretty predominantly baby leaf, um, microgreens, herbs. Um, but the, the technology is exponentially growing, as, as all technology is, and, um, and we see we have already 
trialled some miniature root vegetables, and we see as, um, that being something that would probably add to the range at a later date. Um, and then, who knows, potentially we could grow, in, theoretically you could grow anything hydroponically, um, it just takes a long time. So you could grow an apple tree, but it would be a very expensive apple. Um, so, uh, yeah. And this is where the cost of energy comes in, when you're talking about yep. the big you know, next step is the cost of energy coming down so we can start to do this exactly. and, and make it more affordable, really. Yep. And that's when you think we'll see other crops happening on the edge of cities, under yeah, these exactly. cities. That's, uh, I mean, so uh, that's the, 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 the game changer, really, is when we have that cheap, abundant electricity um, and, and, and that enables us to grow anything. Because even with LEDs, your, your energy bill must be pretty big. It, it's, um, yeah, it's high. I mean, we, we use um, um, probably what you would use in a, in a house in a day. Um, uh, the, the space we've got at the moment, but that doesn't grow with the space. We've, a lot of that power is coming from the ventilation at both ends. Um, so as we grow into the rest of the farm, that, that cost comes down for us as well. So um, we're currently using about 20% of the space, so we've got quite a lot to grow into. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it sounds like there's a lot of energy being used, but when you compare this to um, a, a greenhouse, um, so a greenhouse that's growing the similar crops to what we're growing, would have um, year round, they would, in the summer, they would be growing crops at the same speed as us. Whereas through the other nine months of the year, they'll be much slower because they haven't got the heat. Unless they pump a lot of heat into the greenhouse, they can, they can speed that crop up. But to produce that heat costs money. So, so for growing the type of crops that we need, that need between 20 and 25 degrees, growing underground is a, is a, a very uh, economical and efficient way of growing it. Just do the house comparison, I missed it. So it's, it's what a house uses in a year, you'd use in a day, was that it? But yeah, yeah, roughly, yeah, at okay. the moment, yeah. Wow, okay, great. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna have to finish shortly, but I, there's only a few of you here, but it'd be great if you've got any questions, anything that's, yeah, shout it out. You line the tunnel. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so we've um, we've we've got some some lining that that uh, TFL and um, a lot of the uh, underground companies use, so a specialist um, sort of lining. Great. How many people do you employ? Uh, we employ nine people at the moment. Nine people. Yes. How do they find working underground? Yeah, um, a, a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people ask this question, um, and um, they, they think we're, you know, sending people underground to... Uh, the, the borrow it, a tribe, is, yeah. it, I mean, this is very similar to working in a warehouse. Um, you know, you don't see the light through the day. Um, it is a very pleasant environment, especially in the farm area. It's got a nice pink light, and um, uh, the people we've got working there, you know, do enjoy it. Um, uh, I know they enjoy it because they tell me. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite a, you know, a new new way of doing it, so they're, they're on board with it. And presumably as technology improves and you can tweak lights, as you were saying, to perfectly replicate Kenya in a particular day or month, you could also have some lights set up for humans in your green room in where the coffee is, you know, to, to go through the, the, yeah. the different times of day and make them feel like they're above ground. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There you go, plenty of space for that. Um, yes, sir? So yeah. In case you can't hear that question, it's how does crowdfunding work and do the investors get shares or some sort yeah, of stake? Yeah, they, they do. So they've got, um, it's a, a limited company and they've got shares um, as, a, as you would buy into any other company as a, a startup. Um, and um, there's quite a lot of uh, um, help with uh, SEIS and EIS tax incentives for that, for startup companies. But um, so, um, yeah, we use this, a platform called Crowdcube and, and they, yeah, we sell equity as well. We give equity. Really interesting place to look at. If you've got a bit of cash burning a hole in your pocket, just to go and browse yeah, some of the projects where you find really interesting ideas like this. And we should say, I mean, you, I think you said to me on the phone, you're about to break even. So, I mean, you really are <coughs> holding your own here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, once we go into this um, in the next few weeks, uh, our plan is to, it's going to this, this new... Uh, uh, supply that we will be going into. And will it be uh, nationwide supply? I mean, is it something that people can look out for if they're not in the capital? Uh, it will be London-based to start with, to but start uh, with. then uh, we'll maybe looking to, to scale Watch it from space. there. They've so. got a very good website, <laughs> so you can keep an eye on their progress. Uh, yes, sir. Future growth and limits <coughs> to crowdfunding. Um, I mean, would it be angels next stage or when? Yeah. yeah. So we. So the initial round was about six. So we to, to date we raised about 1.5 million. 650,000 was the first round of crowdfunding. We did go back and we raised another 200,000. The rest of the money came from um, uh, angel investors 
and we're now talking to you know uh, investment uh, small investment houses and things like that for for scale and debt from the bank. Um, as we get to prof uh, as we get to break even, then it's more likely we're going to get some more help from the bank, whereas they haven't been as helpful up until now. And we haven't done any gags about seed funding, so um, yeah, that's probably a good thing. Um, anyone else? Well, look, it's. I'm sorry there weren't so many people, but they were very engaged. No, that's great. And uh, I think this is one of the most fascinating sessions. We've, we've tucked it away at the end of the, of the Country Fire Live, but really, really genuinely sort of transformative. And thank you so much. One more time for Richard Ballard. Thank you. Thank you.